Good morning. Welcome to worship. It's good to have you at Trinity with us today. If you are visiting, um, there is an info card in the pew rack in front of you. Um, please fill that out and let us know that you were here. And if you'd like us to contact you in some way, email or card or phone call, you can mark that on there as well. We'd love to know that you were here and uh, to get to know you some more. Um, announcements. Uh, if you have your bulletin with you, you can uh, look in there. Uh, some things that are going on. We'll start with today. Right after this service, there is a preteen lunch. That's our fifth and sixth graders. We're gonna be at La Placita. You can either drop off there or you can meet in the gathering area if you need a ride and pick up is at 1 p.m. Uh, then tonight we have deacon ordination and installation service here in the sanctuary. That'll be at six o'clock. We have eight deacons that are starting a new uh, three-year rotation and three of those deacons are new and so they will be ordained this evening. This Wednesday night, we have our regular activities for uh, children's missions groups and youth Bible study and adult prayer meeting, uh, and then supper also before that at 445 till 6 o'clock. Um, in your bulletin, there's also an, insert, an extra insert. It says, be a VIP, and that means uh, volunteer in preschool. So if you are interested in helping in our preschool, we have several different ways uh, that you can do that and different times because we have two services. So uh, you can just mark on there what you're interested in and put that in the offering plate and we will get in touch with you um, about that. There's a disaster relief trip coming up. There's uh, details are in your bulletin. There's a sign up sheet in the gathering area. It'll be October the 4th through the 8th. It'll be at Port St. Joe, Florida. It's a Hurricane Michael cleanup. And there will be a meeting about that on September the 22nd. But you can put your name down, talk to Glenn, get more details. Um, Christmas music is coming up. Our adult choir will be preparing for uh, Christmas. And rehearsals start uh, September the 4th. So not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday night. They're from 7 to 7.45 for just the Christmas music. So if you would like to, to just join the choir for a season, for the Christmas season, uh, you are welcome to do that. You can talk to Taylor or just uh, show up on September the 4th at 7. And then finally, we have a tailgating party uh, on September the 6th. That is a Friday night at Madison City Stadium. Uh, James Clemens and Bob Jones are playing that evening. Um, there are a couple of ways that can help you out, having the tailgate party. Can get you there early for a good parking space before it gets crazy, because we start serving at five o'clock. Uh, and also it's a free supper. So we'll have hamburgers and hot dogs. You can invite uh, uh, family, friends, uh, bring a camping chair and hang out uh, before the game, but that's on September the 6th. And then uh, Chris Crumbly is chair of our finance committee, and he will be coming to give you an update from that committee. Right from hamburgers and hot dogs to the finances. Uh, what a great uh, segue. Thank you, Teresa. Um, so I'm Chris Crumbly. I'm your chairman of your finance committee. And I just thought that we would give you a chance to uh, kind of where we are uh, in our financial situation. We're actually very healthy. As a church right now, uh, we're at uh, we like to keep uh, right around two times our uh, annual, our our monthly expenses in the bank. Right now, we're at 1.8 of our monthly expenses in the bank right now, which uh, puts us about $134,000 in budget expenses. So pretty healthy, um, but I'll tell you that we're about $39,000 below uh, what we had expected for our our regular income uh, over the year. That's not as, uh, as bad as some years. It's a little worse than others. But the thing is that this church has been um, typically a fourth quarter church. Uh, so in the football season, we're looking forward to a good fourth quarter. Uh, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll look for that. Um, our budget this year was $932,000. Uh, we'll be starting to set that budget uh, here in the next uh, couple of weeks, next few weeks um, to consider that. Um, there's a lot of things that will be coming up that we're going to have to make some decisions. Ron and I have already talked about some of the things that are going on. Um, it turns out that um, air conditioners love to go out in the summertime, and uh, that's, uh, that has happened a little bit. So that's helped us a little bit with our uh, challenges. Uh, but there's some other things that will be coming up that we'll be deciding on how that, that works through this year. Uh, so far, we have uh, 512400 that's been given through July. And that's about 7% below budget. Again, not terrible. Just, you just need to know where we are. And uh, we're not in a bad shape. 
But one thing I do want to talk about, and, and each of you can do this, and we started this back in October of 17. It's called 30 for 30. We've been doing this now for 22 months, and so far we brought in $56,000 uh, in the 30 for 30. What that was is, is if each of us would consider giving $30 for 30 months, we would try to buy down our mortgage uh, the, in a way that when, when December 21, when that mortgage becomes due, we've got a, either a balloon payment or we'll have to refinance some of it. So the, bet, the quicker that we can pay off that mortgage, the quicker that we'll have some other monies that we can expend on things uh, in our mission world and also for our physical plant and the things that we've talked about. So this little card that's in your, uh, in your pew rack, if you just write on the bottom 30 for 30, you can put that in there. And, uh, and Glenn, you don't have to just have $30. You could do more than 30. Um, Thank you, Chris. So, okay, I just wanted to let you know. Uh, so uh, you can put any amount that you want in there. You can do that uh, also through our electronic giving. But um, of that $56,000, what that does is our loan payment is about $8,000 a month. We're, we've been able to add $2,000 to $2,500 on the principal to pay that down even quicker. But there's 28 more months left in this mortgage. That means we would need $188,662. So divide that up into uh, how much that uh, Glenn needs to give um, and how much you would like to, uh, to ask him. Uh, I'm sorry, Glenn, you're doing fine. You're doing fine. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you afterwards. But uh, anyway, uh, thank you. Thank you for your giving. Thanks for being a giving church. And, um, and if you have any questions, you can see me. Uh, you can see John Howell, which I get all these numbers from John Howell. Uh, excellent treasurer. Uh, Lynn Hogan uh, for another couple of weeks. Uh, Jerry Wheeler and uh, Java Bennett is going to be uh, joining us. And so um, uh, I wouldn't ask her yet, but in a couple of weeks you can ask her uh, all about that too. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. At this time, I invite you to please stand for the passing of the peace. In worship, we continue to look at the book of Revelation, and we are all the way to the Battle of Armageddon today. That's the final fight between good and evil in the world, and though it's a, a little scary to think about, it's really meant to give us hope. We're fighting smaller battles every day against evil in the world and in ourselves, um, but the message of Revelation is John's way of saying, God is with you, God is with us, hang in there. Welcome to worship. Please join me in prayer. Oh God, be with us as we worship today. May your spirit be with everyone who is leading in music, prayers, scripture reading, and with Pastor Mike as he shares your word with us. Help us to have ears to hear what you want us to know this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us now sing together our hymn of invocation, hymn number 395, God of grace and God of glory. Please stand as we sing together.
hear these words from the book of Proverbs to prepare our hearts for a time of be still and know. Proverbs 10, 19. When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. An author comments on this passage. This is a truth that could drive us to, to despair, given so many words that flow from our mouths, pens, and computers. Silence is the only cure for this situation. Right speech comes out of silence. Let's pause now in our silence. May it help our speech because we are more in touch with the Spirit of God. Let's pray together. Dear God, in the stillness and silence, we wait and we listen. We confess we do not do this well. Thank you for your grace. We want to be close to you, so we listen in silence. We seek you. We spend time with you. In your name we pray. Amen. Lord, I come. I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, or the one that guides my heart, Lord, I need sin runs deep your grace is more where grace is found is where you are and where you are Lord I am free holiness is Christ in me Lord I need Temptation comes my way When I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay Lord, I need Oh God, how I need 
defense my righteousness oh god how i need you Our scripture today uh, is found in the book of Revelation, uh, both in chapter 17, verses 1 through 6, and then in chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. I invite you to read along with me. One of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of that great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that that woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. And then in 19, verses 11 through 16, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him, that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. May God bless the reading of his word. At this time, our pre-K and our kindergartners are invited to exit for children's worship as we sing together our hymn of submission, hymn number 277, Take My Life and Let It Be. Please stand as we sing together.
Some missionaries serve in locations that we have to be careful talking about because of safety issues. We have to even be careful about sharing their names. That's the case with today's mission moment. CBF missionaries Tommy and Joan, and that's not their real names, work ministering to college students in Southeast Asia. Their student ministry is made up of believers in Christ, students who don't know what they believe, and some students who are committed to other faiths. One student in particular joins the group for regular Bible study. She comes each semester to the retreat and even joined other students at a Good Friday service. But when Joan asked her what her family's response would be if she became a Christian, the student's answer was, I have an uncle that would prefer that I die rather than become a Christian. Please take a moment and pray for missionaries ministering in difficult situations and for the people they are serving. Amen. Good morning. I'm so glad you're here today. We are in the midst of a series of sermons on the book of Revelation. We have one left next week. Today we have come to the great battle. And this is one of those uh, parts of Revelation that's captured imagination since the very beginning of people looking through this very strange and I think frankly an odd book in our Bible. It's the very last one in our New Testament. And it talks about this great battle that sometimes has been called Armageddon. Maybe you've heard that word before, Armageddon. That word only occurs one time in all of Scripture in chapter 16 of Revelation, verse 16, Armageddon. And when we come into the battle, there's only two or three verses actually that describe the battle. All the buildup over chapter 16, 17, 18, and 19 is about this battle. And throughout those chapters, we're in seeing these images of these strange animals and beasts and people and armies. There's all kinds of stuff there. 
There is a beast that rises up out of the sea. There is a beast that comes with seven heads and ten horns. And uh, on the beast, riding this beast, is this gaudy woman called Babylon, Rome, uh, all decked out more than she should be in an ugly sort of fashion, scary fashion. And she rides into battle. Uh, we'll see the dragon, which represents Satan, the adversary of God in this story. And when I was looking at this passage and thinking, why did I pick it to preach on, number one? <laughs> um, I was thinking of all these images. It reminds me of going into some kind of antique store or thrift store, and you're just like overwhelmed with all this stuff everywhere. And there's so much to see, and then sometimes I realize there really wasn't much to see after all when I got, come out of the store. And one of the ways I wanted to approach the sermon as I thought about it after the early service is the busyness and the turmoil of the battle. I wanted to sort of preach something that's more calm. And so you'll just sort of hear me talk a little bit about this today. And so I think that's an offset because I believe that's something we need in the midst of the busyness of this story. The other side of it is that the sermon had to be preached now at 1030 on Sunday, but I don't think it's quite written. So I think it's still hopefully some words that you'll hear today that I hope that you'll continue to hear and live with as God continues to write the sermon about this great story, the battle. Okay? Now we get that word Armageddon, it actually comes from a Hebrew word, har Megiddo. Har is the Hebrew word for mount, and Megiddo is a place. It was an ancient city in Israel. So Mount Megiddo. I've been there. It's been layers and layers. Now a tail, a mountain, but probably was just a fortified city in ancient times. And the valley that it overlooks is part of a road. It's an ancient road called the Via Maris that stretched from Egypt through the Fertile Crescent all the way to Mesopotamia in modern day Iraq. It was a great trade route of ancient times. And armies also going back and forth between the Babylonians and the Assyrians and the Egyptians and so forth all went through Via Maris. And Megiddo was a fortified city that was like a big toll booth on the road. And so controlling that area was very, very important. And we know of at least 34 major battles that were fought on these plains here near this ancient uh, town of Megiddo, Harmageddon and uh, that fortified city. Napoleon Bonaparte sent his French troops there, for example, and he said later, this is the most natural battleground of the whole earth. And it is the, the beginning of written military history, the first recorded history of a battle. We know humans have, have been involved in war since probably the very beginning, but the first time we have a written account of a battle or a war is from the 15th century B.C., when Pharaoh Tutmos III comes up to fight the Canaanite confederation here on these plains of Megiddo. And we have a scribe for the Pharaoh who wrote down the details of the battle. It's the first written record of any military battle. And then later, as Tutmos is preparing to die, he wants the, the exploits written on the walls uh, of the, the stones in Karnak in modern-day Egypt. And that's where we find the first written record of any human warfare we have. But there are a lot of other battles there. In the Old Testament, one of the great judges, Deborah, and her general Barak de defeat Cicero in this area, this battleground. Saul, the first king of Israel, fights a Pharaoh from Egypt in their battles. Josiah, one of the great reforming kings of Israel, dies fighting Pharaoh Necho out there on those plains across from the town of Megiddo. In the 12th century, there were four battles fought between Saladin and the Crusaders. In the 14th century, the Egyptian Malamuks fought the Mongols here. And in 1799, the French troops under Napoleon fought against the Ottomans there. And then one of the more famous battles of, ancient, of modern times was in World War I when General Allen Allaby of the British Expeditionary Forces fought the Ottoman Turks and defeated them. Allenby rides into Jerusalem. Uh, and then that creates what we know as the British Mandate that created Palestine and Transjordan or Jordan, modern-day Jordan, and the country of Iraq, creating borders that had not existed before. And then in 1948, there was a battle there related to the Jewish War of Independence for Israel versus some of the uh, liberation armies of the Arabs uh, in that area. So Armageddon. And we come to the Bible, we think about this last great battle that will be fought between the forces of good and evil. 
And in case there's any suspense before I go any further in the sermon, good wins. So I just want to go ahead and get that, that part uh, out of the way. God wins. Good is the victor and evil is defeated. My campus minister, Bob Ford, when he talked about some of the stuff in Revelation and the analysis that has been poured into it all through the years, talked about the great debate about these thousand-year reign, millennialism. And there are theories about it called premillennialism and postmillennialism and amillennialism. And he would always say, I believe in panmillennialism. It's all going to pan out in the end. And it will. God wins. And the good is victorious. And it's very hopeful for Christian churches who were struggling in the early Roman Empire and for Christian churches today. And in this vision that John sees of all of this, he sees not only a vision of this gaudy woman riding on a beast coming into battle, but he also sees heaven open and he sees Jesus riding on a white horse. It's really amazing. He rides in, and I was telling one of our younger church members this week that on his thigh there's a tattoo that reads King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the church members said, man, that's cool. Jesus had a tattoo. I've got a tattoo. And I thought that was pretty cool. And in this uh, story, as Jesus comes, his eyes are blazing fire, and he has many crowns that he's wearing. And John says he notices his robe that's dipped in blood. And note, this is before the battle occurs. It's not the blood of his enemies. It's probably his own blood. Someone said this is the whole gospel of Jesus giving his life even for his enemies. Now, there's an old saying that sometimes people come unprepared for conflict. And the old saying is, they brought a knife to a gunfight. Well, one of the most odd features of this story is Jesus coming with a sword protruding out of his mouth, which John says is his words, the word of God. So take note of that. I think it's the most important characteristic of the whole battle. Our Lord Jesus comes on the horse with the blazing eyes and all this stuff, but only brings one weapon to the fight. And that weapon is words. It's his words. Now, there's a lot of power in words, aren't there? Words that are spoken to us throughout our lives can carry a lot of meaning to us, and some of those words we cherish from loved ones. Sometimes humans put together words in certain ways, trying to communicate how we feel. One of those ways that's very special to me is poetry. It speaks to us in a way that sometimes common words and language can't do. You know, two roads diverged in the woods, for example. Back before we could actually see our leaders on television or on devices, we would listen to their words through the radio. In the beginning of the inauguration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in our nation, while the depths of the Depression were hitting, he stood on this Capitol steps for his inauguration speech, and we didn't get to see him, but we could hear him through the radio say these words, Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Those words were powerful to a nation and a world gripped with depression. And during the days of the Battle of Britain in World War II, Winston Churchill went again on the radio. They couldn't see him, but they could hear this feisty prime minister saying, we shall never give up. Never, never, never. And when you were a kid, you probably heard somebody, a mother or grandmother or grandfather, someone very well-intentioned say, remember, sticks and stones can break your bones, <clears throat> but words, but then, then we live life. And we know that words can feel like broken bones. It can be very hurtful to us when they're spoken. They can also be very healing to us because they have great power. In Proverbs 15, verse 1, it says, A soft answer has the power to turn away wrath, but grievous words can stir up anger. In World War II, in the factories that created the armament for our allied effort against uh, Hitler and against the Axis powers, a lot of the factories would have signs and posters in them, and some of the posters would read, Loose lips sink ships, right? The power of words. In the New Testament, James talks about the tongue. It's a small part of our body, but it helps form the words we speak. And he said Those, that little tongue is small, but it's like the rudder of a giant ship, and it has the ability to steer the ship in different directions. Or it's like a spark that can create a great forest fire. Words can do that. I remember my grandmother, 
showing me some V-mail from World War II from my granddaddy who fought in Europe and how much these people at home, like her, waited for word from the troops, from her husband, who was on the front lines of the battles in World War II, finally getting V-mail, called Victory Mail. It was the kind of wording that they could use in letters to send back. I have a photo on my desk in a frame that Mary gave me some years ago. It's all my old boys when they were little. They're all grown up now with deep voices. But on this photo, there's a little button where they could record a message. And from time to time, I like to hear their words. It's still those little voices that I remember that are now, those voices are deep and gone now, but those little voices still echo in my heart. And I can press the button and hear them say, Happy Father's Day, we love you. And that has a lot of meaning to me. Someone once said, the pen is mightier than the sword. And one of the ones in English that wielded the pen the most mightily was William Shakespeare. One of the things he did was add words to our vocabulary, some of them we know well, like addiction, or arch-villain, bedazzled, swagger, and fashionable. I saw where a husband was reading some report in a newspaper to his wife, and he said, look, it says here that women use about 30,000 words a day, and men use only about 15,000 words a day. And the wife replied, that's because we have to repeat everything to the man. <laughs> To which the husband said, what'd you say, honey? <laughs> Maybe you've seen the movie Blindside, Sandra Bullock, the story of Michael Orr, an NFL football player in Mississippi. And as he was growing up, there was a story where this family, the Tui family, uh, found him walking on the road early one November morning, very cold, wearing nothing but shorts and a t-shirt. Later on, Sean Tui, the father in, in real life of that story, uh, told a group about the power of two words that were spoken in the car that changed their lives and changed Michael's life. Uh, they were driving by and they drove by Michael walking on the side of the road on that cold morning and Leanne Tui, the wife, said, turn around. And they did. They turned the car around. They stopped. And they invited Michael into the warmth of their car and later adopted him into the warmth of their family. Words have a lot of power, don't they? And Jesus used words too. Words that we rely on, particularly when we're in times of uncertainty or grief or darkness in our lives. The Bible tells us that Jesus Himself is ultimately the Word of God. The in-flesh communication of God and everything that He did, said, and continues to do in our world. The Word of God. Jesus spoke many wonderful words that mean a lot to us today. I have come into the world not to condemn the world, but to save it. Bless you. Rise and sin no more. Your sins have been forgiven. I'm coming to your house today. Or God is spirit. And those who worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. And once Jesus said, Do not think that I've come to do away with all the words of the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And maybe one of the greatest for us at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, lo, I am with you always, wherever you go to the end of the age. Jesus speaks some words that are very powerful. They continue to comfort us, to guide us. They compel us and commission us, and sometimes they convict us, don't they? There's times in our lives when we go back to these words. We're in such shape and situations that we need the words of Jesus to hold us again, to give us the strength to get through. The words that guide us when we're unsure what we should do and how we should carry ourselves in the world. Many times as a pastor, I've read these words of Jesus and of the Bible to those who are in the bed, sick unto death, but needing the words of Scripture to hold them one more time. Or to families who have lost someone they've loved, and in the depths of their grief, no other words will quite do like the words of God. In John 7, Jesus was teaching at the temple in Jerusalem and caused such discord with his words there was a debate about who this guy was and whether he had the right to teach at the temple at all. Finally, the guards at the temple go to the temple priests and report all of the turmoil that Jesus is causing with his words. And the priest said, why didn't you just arrest him and bring us this man today here? And the guard said, well, no one ever spoke the way this man does. Earlier, Jesus noticed that the power of His words were very demanding. And they were so demanding that some 
fell away from following him. The crowds that were listening to him began to be smaller. There weren't as many. And so at one point, he calls his friends, his disciples together and said, Will you also desert me and leave? Because my words are very demanding. And the disciples say in that passage, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So part of our spiritual formation as a people of God is to attend to the words of God. And throughout our whole life, we have to think about how we can continue to be exposed to these words because these words have the power to shape the kind of people we are, the kind of family members we are, co-workers, the neighbors we are, the kind of people we are out in the world. And we do that by exposing ourselves over and over again to the written words of the Bible and to the incarnate word of Jesus Christ through our relationship to Him. Jesus once said, My sheep know my voice. They can hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. But how can we know if we don't pay attention to the voice? So we must spend our entire lives learning the tone of that one significant voice in all the words that are spoken in our world today, even the words that come from our hearts. We have to spend all our lives learning how it is Jesus decides to speak to you and me as unique, special individuals in this world. And so we come to church over and over again to hear the words and to get used to how the words are spoken into our souls. And over and over again, we go to the Bible to read it for ourselves or to listen to it being read. Over and over again, we must go to God and pray in relationship with that great Word of God incarnate. Over and over again, we try to go serve in places where we think we will find Jesus because He tends to hang out in those places of great need in the world. And over and over again, we must contemplate what Jesus Christ means to us in this world, listening for the words that give us life and sustain us. So I want to ask you, what word do you need to hear today from your Lord Jesus? What's the word you're thirsty for? The word you need, you're longing for? And also consider that Jesus is still speaking, speaking words into our lives, but sometimes we're too busy, too distracted, or just too obtuse. Our ears are closed to hear Him. When Jesus was once asked, what's the best or greatest commandment of all? He quotes an Old Testament passage. You should love the Lord your God with all you are, your strength, everything about you. And He's quoting an Old Testament passage. And in that Old Testament passage, well known to Jewish believers, is a beginning word in Hebrew called Shema. That's how the whole thing starts. Shema is a word for listen. Listen. The Lord is God. The Lord is one. And you should love the Lord your God with all you are. The power of Jesus' words can uphold us, sustain us, comfort us, convict us, and commission us. But we have to listen, don't we? And it takes a lifetime to learn how to do that. So perhaps it's not so amazing that when the great Armageddon battle finally gets there, that Jesus rides in armed with nothing more than words. It's the only weapon that He ever brings to any battle. It is a word that He used to stop the storms from causing harm. It's a word that cast out demons from those who were possessed. The word that called disciples to come and follow Him, that healed the sick, that convicted the sinful and brought down the proud. At a word, He wins in the very end. The great battle is really not much of a battle at all because nothing, nothing can withstand the words of Jesus. At a word, God wins. And all those powers that scare us, all those things that we worry about, they will all dissolve away. Not the beasts, not the woman riding on that beast, Rome, Babylon, not the dragon, the Satan, adversary of God, no armies, no power, nothing else can stand before the word of Jesus. He speaks, and it is settled. In the very beginning, God spoke, and everything was created. And at the very end, God will speak again through the word of God, Jesus Christ, and all evil will be gone. All pain, all death, all the things that make us mourn, God wins. 
with a word. It's the only weapon he really ever uses. And one of the words that is spoken in the context of this great battle is a word I thought it would have been important for us to hear again today. It's spoken in chapter 18. And it's a simple word. Come. Come was one of the worst, first words Jesus utters in Scripture. Come and see. Come and follow me. And people did come. They left a lot of things behind to come after Jesus. They left their anger, their bitterness. They left their nets. They left their livelihoods. They left everything at that simple invitation. And a lot of you have accepted that before. In your own life, you've heard Jesus say to you, come, and you've come. But from time to time, it's good to hear the word again. For whatever reason in our own lives, to hear Jesus once more say, come, follow me. Come, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, come unto me. Come and enter into the salvation of your souls. Come and go to work into the fields already ripe unto harvest. Come and forgive those who have sinned against you just as I have forgiven you. Come and let me love you. You know, the biggest problem these early Christians had in the Roman Empire was enticement. They were persecuted by the empire, but they were also enticed by it also. The very empire that would harm them physically, harm them more deeply by enticing them. And that's why this woman is so gaudy and ugly in this scene in chapter 17. This scene unmasks her for what she really is the perversion of her and her enticement, Babylon, Rome, and any empire that continues to do that in our world today. Drawing us people of God from Jesus into the ways of things that would oppose Jesus. The carrot of the empire became more powerful than the stick. And it's still that way. In Laodicea and Sardis, two churches addressed early in the book of Revelation, they become so well-to-do so materially comfortable, they fit in very well with their neighbors in the empire and they forget those who are in great need at their door. In Pergamum and Thyatira, they want social harmony so much that they begin to accept the religion of the empire as normative for their own religion. The desire to fit in is very powerful for us. The ways of the empire can easily become our ways. You think about it. When we in our, in our society have conversations with those we do not agree with, instead of being able to simply discuss, we are afraid to have difficult conversations. And when we have those conversations, we tend to fight. We tend to try to demonize the other position. I remember Wendell Berry once saying something that's always been convicting to me. Did you finish killing everybody who was against peace? Very convicting, using our words to hurt and harm and divide. John's image of these contestants in this great battle is meant to challenge our loyalties, our deepest sense of identity. To whom do we belong? The voice in chapter 18 says, come out of her. Come out of her. It doesn't mean to come out of the world. It actually means to let the world come out of you and come out of me to live in the world, but to remember who we are, the kind of people we have chosen to be, we've called to be, to live our lives in such a way that we remember we must follow the crazy upside down way of the real King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's why in the water, we always ask you before you're baptized, what is your confession of faith? What do you most truly believe? And we answer, Jesus, He is my Lord, and He is my Savior. And that means His ways must become our ways. And they are peculiar ways, which means we must not always fit in in the world. We must be peculiar. We must be different. We must be upside-down people, creating even in church an alternative to all of the communities that we can find ourselves attached to in the world. I think sometimes we sing that little song that we learned when we were kids, this little light of mine, and then we stop singing because we love the little light and it's mine and it gives us a lot of joy. 
and we keep it to ourselves because it gives us comfort. But the song was meant to have another line to it. This little light of mine, I'm supposed to let it shine. And if we don't let it shine, if we don't let the ways of Jesus become more and more our ways by being exposed to Him, the Word of God, then our hearts become hard, we become complacent, we become callous, and we become hard of hearing so that it is difficult for us to even recognize the voice of the words when they're spoken to us. In the 1970s, Rebecca Manley Pippert wrote a book called Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World. She used the image Jesus used of us being salt for the world. But she said a lot of the salt she noticed in churches, they tend to like to stay in the salt shaker with other salt. And she was compelling us and asking us to get out of the shaker and be salt like Jesus intended us to be in the world. One of the things she wrote was this, the person who seeks acceptance is controlled by the people he or she wants to please. We do not control ourselves. We're supposed to be controlled by the Lord of our lives. So maybe we need to hear that cry again, that simple word of Jesus. Come, come out of her and come unto me. Maybe we need to see Jesus at that last great battle carrying only one weapon, the word of God. Only that weapon into the battle. And maybe that means every day our prayer should be, Lord, continue to let my life be a word-shaped life, shaped by your words as I go out into the Armageddons of this existence that we have. Imagine that. Imagine if people took that seriously, allowing the word to shape their lives. Hundreds of us, thousands of us, millions of us, going out into the Armageddons of the world, into all of that chaos, a word-shaped life straight from the mouth of Jesus Christ. Nothing could stand against it. And what a world it would be. In 1864, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote a poem that was later turned into a song we sing a lot of times at Christmas. He said, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, and in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But the bells are ringing like a choir singing. Does anybody hear them? Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then rang the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does He sleep. The wrong shall fail. The right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill to men. There are two times that I know of where Jesus faces Satan. After His baptism, He goes out into the wilderness for 40 days. And there He meets Satan three different times. And the only weapon He brings with Him is the Word of God. You remember once he says to Satan, people can't live just on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then here, at the great battle, bringing only the weapon of his words, riding on that white horse with eyes blazing like fire, just bringing words. And his word's enough. It is enough. Imagine, imagine our lives shaped simply by the words of God, coming out of the mouth of Jesus, being people shaped by His words, out into a world full of people struggling with their own Armageddons, out into society, battling it out among each other, and then we go out into it, shaped by the words of Jesus. Just as we promised Jesus we would when we came out of those waters of baptism. Imagine your life a word-shaped life answering the call to come one more time to be a follower of Jesus. So that's my invitation. Come. Let us come again to Jesus and see what the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords might do through us. Come. Amen. Hello, I'm Mike Oliver. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship through our church website. And also, I'd like to invite you to come and visit us. This is a great church. We have friendly people here. We value worship. We value community and global missions. And there are programs for children all the way to senior adults. I think you'll like our church, and I hope you'll come and visit us and see for yourself in person. 
If you have questions about our church, like to know more, we'd love for you to contact us. There's information on our website. You can call us or email us or come by, and one of our staff members will be glad to talk with you. Welcome to Trinity, and God bless you and keep